All right, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Professor Stelian Koros, who is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science here at ETH Zurich, and he leads the Computational Robotics Lab. So something about Stelian, he received his PhD in Computer Science from the University of British Columbia in 2011, and he then was, before joining ETH, he was an assistant professor in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. In his research, Stelian bridges the fields of robotics, visual computing, and computational fabrication, leveraging fundamental advances in numerical simulation and motion control algorithms. Uh, if you look at his webpage, he has a huge amount of videos and cool applications. The applications range from studying principles of dexterous manipulation and legged locomotion uh, to computation-driven design for bio-inspired robots. So it's, it's very, very broad and very cool. He has won a number of awards, uh, among which I note the ERC Consolidator Grant. And today he's going to talk about physics-based modeling and the quest for intelligent robots. Uh, I, I was reading the abstract, I've been following his work, and personally I'm very excited about the talk, and I, I think so is the audience of Autonomy Talks. So without further ado, Stelian, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for also inviting me to give this talk. Um, so uh, I, I suppose all of us in here are excited about autonomy and robotics. Uh, we're going to go under this assumption. Um, and if you go back and, and look at the origin of the word robot, it comes from a, a play um, that came out about 100 years ago. I think it's 101 years ago. Uh, and it already kind of put forward this vision of a robot having the shape of a human and being capable of doing things that humans do. And over the next 100 years in science fiction, robots have appeared in many different uh, shapes and forms. And personally, I grew up with this vision of what the future might hold. Um, and so probably like many of you here, I'm excited not about just watching the future on a TV screen, but also trying to figure out how to make the science fiction a reality. And we're not talking about evil robots uh, taking over the world, but rather skilled robots um, who are able to play a very active role in helping us uh, improve our daily lives um, with, with a variety of different applications. Um, and so this sort of new techno technological revolution that we've seen in science fiction uh, is what motivates much of the work that we do in my lab. And if I had to summarize it, our quest is one for robot intelligence. And intelligence, of course, has many different um, definitions. The definition of intelligence that, that we take to heart is uh, the one that, that Rodney Brooks gave in this quote. So intelligence is determined by the dynamics of interactions with the world. In other words, how can we make autonomous robots who are able to have meaningful interactions with people and various objects in the world um, and, and ultimately be able to display the same level of skill and dexterity that, that we see in humans and animals. So this is the, the main mission for us. And just to give you an overview of the types of projects that we do in our lab, uh, I would say these are our um, main pillars, the pillars of our research program. We do a lot of work in uh, locomotion and we we study both traditional legged robots as well as uh, robots that combine concepts from uh, legged locomotion and wheeled locomotion to make new hybrid robots that are able to to move in entirely new ways so things that we have we don't see in nature um, we do collaborate quite a bit with other people from ETH as you can also see in, in these videos here um, and more recently we've started to think about um, combined locomotion and manipulation capabilities. Dexterous manipulation is another core area of research for um, our group. And here we are inspired, or I am personally inspired by the things that uh, we see, you know, even children be, being able to do so easily. And it turns out when you're trying to program a robot to do some of these things, uh, we realize how much we don't know uh, in terms of the way in which we interact with objects in, in such an easy way. 
Um, and so, as I was mentioning, one of one of the, the main areas of research is dexterous manipulation, and we focus on non-rigid objects and objects that exhibit uh, interesting dynamics. So things that really have to be able to to be taken into account. Um, the third area. Uh, core area of research is in soft robotic materials and computational design. So uh, here we are trying to figure out how to leverage uh, emerging technologies, uh, digital fabrication, for example, and the, the new range of um, capabilities we have in terms of materials and geometric complexity, and try to make robots that uh, go well beyond the, the standard sort of mental, metal monsters that, that we currently see in, uh, in factories. Um, and to leverage the, the space of fabrication capabilities, we do a lot of work in computational design, trying to come up with algorithms that will inform the design process so that we don't have to rely on trial and error methodologies. And last but not least, um, we, we want robots who are able to interact with people. Ultimately, it's all about um, building a better future for people. And so we do focus also on sort of areas of research that, uh, that are in a, around or with people uh, in robotics. And for this, we do leverage uh, mixed reality technologies to figure out how robots and humans can communicate, how can they understand each other, how they can help each other to solve tasks in, a, in various ways. Um, and so these are some of the, the prototypes of the, the work that we've been doing recently in this space. Now, in terms of an overarching methodology, um, we rely a lot on simulation modeling, so physics-based models. Um, and our goal here is to develop the, the types of models that will enable machines to understand at an appropriate level of abstraction how physical objects move and deform. If robots have the ability to predict the way in which their um, physical interactions will affect the world, then they can also plan and make sure that the outcome is a desirable one. So this is why we also focus a lot on um, algorithms that basically leverage the simulation models for motion planning or control uh, problems, as well as for computational design. So these sort of algorithmic um, design approaches that I'll just talk a little bit about later. And last but not least, um, we leverage data as much as we can to reduce computational burden, to bridge the reality gap, and also to enable learning by demonstration. Um, and it's this fusion of simulation algorithms and data that we call computational robotics. So it's basically what, what, um, what we try to focus on in our group. Now, um, the reason why we, why we focus so much on, on simulations is because these virtual environments are able to provide robots with a playground where they can fine tune their motor skills in a way that is safe, uh, that, that allows them to explore without you know, hurting those around them or, or damaging themselves. Um, and if we do all of this work properly in simulation, then the, the types of control policies that are developed in simulation can be carried over to the physical world. So the sim to real transfer is, uh, is a core uh, type of problem that we're looking at as well. Now, simulations, of course, have been around for a very long time. And our goal is to try to extract as much information from simulation as possible. Um, and this is where I'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing um, over the past years in differentiable simulations. So to just give you a high level idea of what I mean by this, simulations are typically used in a forward setting. You, you create a simulation model for the dynamical system that you're trying to predict the behavior of. You run the simulation. And if you're doing this well enough, then basically what you're going to get as a result is a prediction of how the state of this dynamical system will evolve over time. And in, in a forward problem, what you can do is change some kind of initial conditions. For example, you can take this beach ball change the initial velocity, you could run the simulation again, and with that, you'll see a new prediction. So this is called the forward problem. Of course, you can think of ways of using this for, uh, for optimization of control uh, policies and motion planning and so on. 
But what we wanted to formalize is an inverse problem where the goal would be to provide, for example, a target location for this beach volleyball at the end of the, the simulation window. And the inverse problem requires the computer to automatically figure out what should be the inputs to the simulation. So in this case, the initial velocity and spin for the uh, beach volleyball, such that at the end of the simulation window, this ball ends as close as possible to the target. So this is now just a, a visualization of the optimization process where you can see that these initial conditions are changing and then we visualize the result of the simulation. And at the end, basically the computer is able to automatically solve this, uh, this problem. And we'll see that we're using gradient-based methods to solve these inverse problems. Now, this is a, a toy example. You know, it could be useful for, for instance, if you have a robot that's trying to toss a ball, but we can use it for all other types of problems in robotics. So here is one uh, where, where we use exactly the same type of methodology to generate locomotion gates for robots that are entirely soft. So here's a, a robot prototype. It's made out of foam. So it's a cast block of foam. Uh, we put some motors that are pulling on cables, uh, which will deform the legs. And we wanted to figure out, you know, can we use this type of inverse simulation uh, paradigm so that the robot can figure out how to walk in the real world. So this is now the simulation model. The goal was to just say, you know, move forward by 20 centimeters or so. And here, what we are visualizing is a, a sped up version of the results of the simulation. And the inputs to the simulation here were the um, actions of the motor. So basically how much do they contract or relax the cables that are running down the wall, uh, running down the, the, the legs of the soft robot. And here in the last part of the video, what we see is a, a successful example of sim to real transfer, where we take this gate that was optimized in simulation, we play back exactly the same commands on the physical prototype, and the result is this robot being able to move forward as predicted by the simulation uh, without falling over. All right, so how does this all work? I'll go in, in just a few details on this. Um, so here's an example of a traditional simulation. And, and just as a simple problem, we're looking at this sort of tossing ball example, where we have some initial conditions, some initial velocity for this squishy ball. We run the simulation. And this is the result of, uh, of the forward simulation run. And yeah, so the input in this case were parameters that describe the initial velocity. Oh. And we can give these labels just to, to help a little bit with the mathematical description of the method that we will talk about. So now we can just say the simulation output is a vector that concatenates the state of this dynamical system at different moments through time. So we call this X of P. Now, for a control problem, we might have a target uh, for the last um, configuration of the ball. And what we might want to say is something like this. If we want to formulate a control as an optimization problem, we want to say, well, give me these in input parameters P that minimize some objective, which is a function of X. And in this case, we can just say the last state should be as close as possible to its target. And if we want to solve this optimization problem with gradient-based methods, what we need to know is how the value of the objective changes with respect to the input parameters. And now if we understand that basically the, the result of the simulation is a function of these input parameters and we just the chain rule, we obtain this expression here. It's all very straightforward. And this is one of the key ingredients that we need. So this is a Jacobian. And it tells us how the entire motion trajectory changes as we change the input parameters. So for a differentiable simulation, we also require it to output this derivative information, which is now visualized here. All right, so let's see how we compute these um, derivatives in an analytic uh, form. We always start from Newton's second law of motion which at a high level says F is equal to MA. No one is surprised about this. Um, now, you can write this ODE, the second order um, 
ordinary differential equation. And then you have to figure out how to discretize this in time to come up with a numerical solution. And there are lots of different answers that you can have. Some of them are explicit time stepping schemes, which will look like this. So um, in, a, in a discrete setting, what you have to do is evaluate the forces acting on the system at the previous configuration or, or the current configuration to figure out what is the acceleration at the next time step. And with implicit time stepping, here we see a very small change. These, these uh, forces are now not a function of the previously known configuration of the dynamical system, but rather dynamical system at the time step that we want to arrive at. This is what makes this an implicit relationship. Uh, there's a lot that can be said about numerical uh, integration schemes from these two different classes. In general, we prefer implicit time stepping scheme because they are numerically much more robust. You don't have uh, strict restrictions on the time step. You can use forces that are quite stiff numerically and, and you still maintain simulation uh, stability. Um, so this is our integration method of choice. We can use uh, BDF1 or two or higher order methods if we want to. But at the end of the day, what every time step boils down to is solving an optimization problem, which we solve using Newton's method, where we find xk, so the configuration of the dynamical system at the next time step, such that essentially Newton's second law of motion is satisfied at the end of the type st time step. And then there are all sorts of details, you know, how do we discretize accelerations and velocities? These are all standard um, finite difference formulas. All right. So to compute one run of the forward simulation for the entire trajectory, we proceed in the standard way. We compute the configuration of the dynamical system at the first time step by solving Newton's method for that, for that time step. We then repeat that process for the second time step and so on and so forth, right? So we basically have to, to solve this nonlinear optimization problem n times. So again, P here is the input that's driving the simulation. What we want is to figure out how this entire trajectory that we've computed by solving a sequence of nonlinear optimization problems, how that sequence changes with respect to the input parameters. And obviously, as we can see here, X of P does not have an analytic form, right? We have to solve numerically the nonlinear optimization um, problems for each time step of the simulation. So this is a little bit interesting. What we want is dx dp, but x of p does not have an analytic form. But, well, if we were to, to sort of take these residuals, it tells us how well we've satisfied the dynamics, and we call this g, a vector g. Then by construction, what we know is that for any p, we compute x of p such that this vector g of x and p is equal to 0. And that happens for any p. And because it happens for any p, that means that the total derivative of this residual vector with respect to p is equal to zero, always. Now we do the chain rule again. We obtain this expression. And what we observe here is that we can actually come up with an analytic formulation for the Jacobian dx dp. And what we need to be able to compute this is some vectors of partial derivatives. Uh, now, just for a little bit of intuition, we can take a look at these matrices and what they contain. So these are all matrices that contain partial or total derivatives. And so if we take a look at this first, um, the, the first matrix here, each block in here will be, tell, will be telling us how the physics residual, so F minus MA, um, changes at time step I with respect to the system configuration at some time step j. And if we recall what the definition for the individual entries of the residual vector g look like, it's easy to see that this matrix has a very sparse uh, structure. And in particular, because, uh, because these are partial derivatives, they can be all computed analytically. All right, now we can basically do the same type of analysis for this, uh, this last matrix here in, in the visualization. So this is telling us how the residual vector G will change with respect to the input parameters and the blocks basically will just index 
different time steps and different input parameters. And okay, now here it depends a lot what P is exactly and how the forces are defined. For typical control problems, it will have a special form um, because yeah, maybe maybe I'll get this. I'll get back to this a bit later. Uh, the point here is that these two matrices of partial derivatives can be computed analytically, and then by solving this linear system, we then compute the Jacobian dxdp analytically, even though um, x of p itself does not have an analytic formulation, which is which is quite nice. Um, and depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, some of these matrices will have very specific sparsity structures, which means you can also develop specialized solvers that exploit the structure to come up with solution much faster. Uh, so a lot of this ends up being problem dependent in, in the end. All right, so um, okay, I see that there's a there's a question in the chat uh, and it might be answered by one of the slides that's coming up uh, next. And if it isn't, then we can we can take it up soon. All right, so um, just to, to take a, a quick look at the, simul the inverse simulation loop here, uh, it would basically take on a very straightforward uh, form. What we do here is uh, we need to compute a change in the input parameters, which if we're doing gradient descent, all we need to know is the, is the gradient that we computed on the previous slide. We then perform a line search on it. This is all sort of textbook, um, nonlinear optimization techniques. We update the parameters according to, to this delta multiplied by the line search parameter, and then we can run another forward simulation to obtain the new um, trajectory that's that's coming out of the, the forward simulation model. So this is the, the typical scheme for gradient descent, which is now enabled as soon as we have the Jacobian DXDP. Again, this, this was kind of the, the formulation that, that we derived on the previous slide. Um, so this is gradient descent. It can work pretty well. Generally speaking, convergence is very slow, which is why we also um, have done quite a bit of work looking at higher order methods for this optimization problem. So in a way that's conceptually similar to, to what we did to derive the gradient, we can also derive analytically the Hessian. Now this does get actually quite involved. Um, there are terms here that are telling us how the sensitivity matrix of how the Jacobian DXDP changes with respect to X and P. We can compute all of those analytically, but as it turns out, um, it's quite slow. And also, the problems that we're trying to solve are unfortunately very often non-convex, which means that when we're doing Newton's method, we sometimes get directions that are pointing, out, pointing us uh, uphill or towards uh, um, indefinite areas of the optimization landscape. So in practice, we often prefer to neglect higher order terms which gives us um, essentially a generalized Gauss-Newton formulation for the optimization problem. So this is our, our method of choice. We've done also some work to speed up the computation of these um, approximate Hessians for the control problems. If you're interested, let me know and I'll point you to some of the relevant papers. All right, so with this simulation paradigm, what we have to start with is a definition of the mechanical system that we're trying to, uh, to model. And we've done quite a bit of work to make sure that we can handle both rigid bodies and soft bodies and the coupling between them. So this is hopefully going to answer the question that was, that was asked in the, in the chat. Uh, so the, what we have to define for every type of uh, multi-body system that we implement is what will its configuration look like? So how do we represent the, the state of this object through time? For a rigid body, that's pretty simple. We can use the standard location of the center of mass and any parameterization for rotations. And we basically take all of those degrees of freedom. We put them into um, a variable called xi. For soft objects, 
we discretize them in space using, for example, the finite element method, or it can be mass spring systems. Um, and the configuration of the entire object is given by the uh, Cartesian coordinates of all of the individual mass points that we have used in the discretization. If we want to couple soft bodies and rigid bodies together, we can use um, simple linear or angular springs. Uh, because we're using implicit integration as the main hammer for time stepping, we can make these coupling sp springs arbitrarily stiff, and we can still use relatively large time steps as we're solving the forward simulation problem. At the end of the day, what's important uh, to be able to solve the forward simulation problem is that the mechanical system outputs the forces that are acting, so internal or external forces, as well as the force Jacobian. So this is, this is the, the basic set of ingredients that we need just for the forward time-stepping problem. And generally speaking, for elastic objects, we always start by defining a potential deformation energy, and then the internal forces that are trying to restore the shape of this object is given as the negative gradient of this potential energy with respect to the degrees of freedom of the object. All right. Um, now, it's the same type of information. So essentially, the, the forces and force Jacobians, these will, uh, these will make up the partial derivative terms that we need in sensitivity analysis. And once we have an entire motion trajectory that comes from the sequence of time steps we have solved for the forward simulation problem, Basically, we have all the information that's required to perform sensitivity analysis and compute the Jacobians that I was talking about. Now, one big thing that is missing here is uh, a model of uh, contact and friction, which is, of course, very important for any um, real, real life system. And this is a bit of an interesting problem because in in reality, um, you know, if you think about the abstraction of a, of a rigid body, well, two rigid bodies are either in contact with each other or they're not in contact with each other. So this is an inherently non-smooth operation, but still because we're trying to uh, model everything as a differentiable problem, we have to come up with a smooth approximation to frictional contact that, that basically provides the same type of information as all other mechanical systems that we're dealing with. So to figure out um, what reasonable approximation of uh, a friction might look like, we started from Coulomb's law of friction, of course, which basically states that no slip occurs between two solids if this condition that relates tangential and normal uh, forces is satisfied. Now, we can take a closer look at what actually is happening. Um, and for this, we're going to assume that we have some object and we have um, a function that takes on a negative value whenever the system is in contact. Uh, it has a positive value when there is no contact between two objects and it's exactly zero when, when the object is on the surface or when, the, when there's just the contact established between two objects. So if we have a mass point that's moving towards this uh, large block here, well, this is the sort of response that we might expect, right, from an elastic uh, collision. And what is happening here is we can think of what is, what is happening in the normal direction at the contact point. Uh, and here, what we do have is a normal component of the force and this normal component of the force needs to satisfy some criterions. Uh, so in, in principle, it has to be just large enough to make sure that no interpenetration happens. Um, it cannot be sticky, so it can only push the two objects apart. It cannot pull them together. Um, and there is also, in principle, this linear complementarity condition has to hold on the uh, on the normal force. So basically, it has to be zero if um, if the object is not collide if the objects are not colliding with each other. All right. 
in the tangential direction, we can look at similar um, constraints that must be applicable to the tangent force. And in particular, we can differentiate the stick regime, basically where, where the friction force is sufficient to make the relative velocity at the contact point be zero. And what happens in the slip domain where we have the, the maximal amount of uh, friction force, which is given by Coulomb's law of friction, and it's acting in a direction that's opposing the relative velocity. Now, for the tangent force in particular, we can plot this uh, definition, definition here of the friction force as a function of the relative velocity of the contact point, and it will look like this. So the dark blues, blue areas here indicate the slip regime, and what happens in the middle is basically we know that the, this, this um, tangent force is sufficiently large to make the relative velocity at the contact point be zero. So essentially, it's this type of behavior that we're trying to approximate using a smooth function or a smooth modifier. There are many different options that one has. Uh, in general, we, we always express the magnitude of the force in the normal or tangential component as a function of x dot. And when, when we have a time discretization, it's going to be a function of the configuration of the system at the next moment in time. And for the normal force, well, it might look something like this. So this is a soft max function. It's differentiable everywhere, which is nice. It's not going to guarantee that no penetrations occur. But the nice thing is that we, we can control, for example, the, the slope of this um, soft max function to make it arbitrarily stiff. So basically to have a response that's arbitrarily aggressive to a small interpenetration. And in a similar way, we can model, uh, we can come up with approximations to the tangential uh, component of the, of the contact force. And instead of having the step function, we can use a tan h function or sigmoids or piecewise linear. And basically all of these will give us at least uh, a first order differentiable model that we can then plug into our um, simulation framework. And we've done quite a few tests to figure out how different choices affect the behavior that we see. And here is one of the, the types of tests that we've done. So we take an elastic object, we drop it on an inclined plane, and with different choices and different stiffnesses, we can observe different outcomes. And what we can see is that because we're using implicit integration, we can make these forces be arbitrarily stiff. And basically, the only price that we pay is that we might have to run more Newton steps for every time step. But otherwise, we're not running into numerical instability problems. And at the end, they all behave quite well. Um, so even for, for such a difficult case, what we're seeing is, well, you know, if, if you're using this approximation, you might get a little bit of creep in the object, but this it doesn't have to be a, a bad effect. And for interpenetration, this can be made arbitrarily small by changing the stiffness of the contact forces. Um, another thing that we that we notice is that actually the the values of the stiffnesses that we're setting for these approximations to the frictional contact can actually have quite a, an important effect on the smoothness of the optimization landscapes. So you know, this shouldn't be too surprising. If the contact forces are, are very stiff, we're getting towards a, a regime where, you know, you might think of a dice that you're, you're throwing on a, on a rigid table, right? Where basically very small change in the initial conditions might make a different corner of the dice hit the table. So of course, from there on, you're gonna get very different behaviors um, of the evolution of the dynamical system in time. And if we make these coefficients smoother, well, basically we're softifying the contact and that makes it better suited for numerical optimization as far as the inverse problem is concerned. And this is also something that we can then leverage in a continuation scheme sort of way when we're solving the types of inverse problems that, that we're looking at. Okay, so basically this is a very brief overview of the approximation model that we have for frictional contact. This also is able to give us forces and force Jacobians. So basically it, it looks a lot like the, the, 
uh, definition of the mechanical systems, we have to just define standard rigid and soft bodies. And so now if we have some kind of objective, we can use the analytic derivatives that come from sensitivity analysis, and we can solve the inverse problems using gradient descent or, or sparse Gauss-Newton to obtain optimal input parameters for the, um, for the problem that we're solving. All right, so uh, I went pretty quickly through the technical description. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you during the Q&A session or point you to papers if you're interested to learn more. Um, one of the things that I like most about the simulation paradigm is that we can use it for a lot of different types of problems. So this is also something that we've been exploring over the past few years. Um, and basically, there's a lot of freedom that we have in terms of how we define the optimization criteria, how we choose our decision variables. So essentially, the, the inputs into the simulation framework. Um, and I'll show you some of the work that we've done in the space. So we can have relatively simple motion goals, you know, have a robot make it move forward, for example, and we can directly solve for control parameters. So these would be per time step and uh, independent set of parameters that might encode torques for the motors or set points for PD controllers. Um, and this allows us to formulate whole body control or model predictive control or trajectory optimization problems. What one problem domain we're applying this kind of methodology to is um, hybrid uh, rigid soft robots. Uh, so basically, we want to model robots in their full complexity. And robots are never fully rigid. The ones that the ones that we are interested in working with, they might have soft feet, or perhaps the motors are compliant. And this is really a, a big difference <laughs> between the physical system that we're trying to compute motions for, and the typical models that we're using, for example, in trajectory optimization. But with this physics in the loop example, we can directly model the robot in its full complexity and solve for motions that, uh, that take into account this complexity. So um, I don't want to show this video again because I did earlier on in the talk, but uh, this, is, this was the example where we said, okay, let's try a really hard uh, model for, for a soft robot. Let's do trajectory optimization for a locomotion gate and see if it transfers over to the real world. All right, um, we also uh, want to be using this kind of thinking about, um, way of thinking about control problems for manipulation of non-rigid objects. I think this is a very challenging and exciting area to be working in. This is a video that shows early results. Uh, what we're seeing here is the control parameters are basically the location of these two uh, blue locations. They're a bit hard to see. Apologies for that. They're basically indicating some, some kind of control handles. And this is an interactive simulation where the yellow locations correspond to targets that we have for this mass spring system. So we're setting a target and then we're figuring out what the trajectories should be for these handles so that the dynamical system undergoing frictional contact will end up in that, in that kind of configuration. So here's the optimization process in in action, and this is the type of solution that we have for this pretty a pretty difficult control problem. <coughs> Here's another example where we're also starting to look at seem to real aspects. So in this case, uh, we have one of our robots. It's holding a thin block of foam, and we wanted to just lay it flat on the table. And so this is the solution that comes out uh, without any priors from the optimization process. And here are some of our sim to real attempts where we just take the trajectories that we optimize in simulation for the uh, arm of the robots and we play them back. And basically it, it tries to take into account the dynamics of the objects that it's holding and make sure that at the end, the outcome, so basically the way in which it's uh, kind of resting on the table um, is, uh, is as we wanted it. So basically the beginning of a laying down flat configuration. All right, uh, we can also, instead of having control parameters that we optimize for, we can optimize over policy parameters. 
And with this, we can solve self-supervised learning or policy optimization problems. Um, one of the first ways in which we started to do this was to add our differentiable simulation um, as a specialized layer in a neural network. So what this neural network does, the, the green part of it is it encodes a policy. So it maps uh, points in problem space to the actions that need to be taken. And then these actions are passed through the differentiable simulation layer. This gives us the motion trajectory. And based on this motion trajectory, we define a loss term. And because the, the, the way to compute the motion trajectory is differentiable, we can basically use that information in the backpropagation step to make sure that the weights of the policy are updated such that the actions that are generated will be minimizing the motion loss um, that we have defined. And this is a, a simple example where we just wanted to see, you know, can we pre-compute a whole lot of problems and basically encode them all into a, into a policy? So for this, we have a robot. It plays uh, this beer pong type game. We wanted to throw a ball that needs to bounce once and then land at a pre-specified location within this training domain. We basically solve a lot of problems um, offline. And after we have this policy learned, we just place this virtual cup, read off the policy, and that gives us the initial conditions for the ping pong such that after one bounce, it lands exactly in the cup. So that works pretty well. Um, in general, I'm, I'm quite excited about the notion of being able to bridge trajectory optimizations versus uh, with, with policy optimization problems. And here, if we just take a very high level view of the math of it, basically for optimization, for trajectory optimization problems, we always solve problems that have this type of form. So we, we have some actions and some control objectives. Well, policy optimization can be formalized in a way that's quite related. And now basically the parameters that we're optimizing for are the parameters that, that define the policy. And the objective is now the, the same type of problem we're solving in trajectory optimization, but integrated over an entire space of problems that we care about. And it turns out that if you look at it in this way, then uh, you can formalize policy optimization using all of the same tools that we have in trajectory optimization. If you're interested, uh, we have two very nice papers on this, uh, on this domain. Uh, and this also opens up a very interesting discussion on how do we um, approximate this integral? How do we sample the problem space and how do we make sure that we get consistent solutions and so on and so forth? So lots to, to, to say about this actually. All right. The input to the parameters can also be specific model parameters. If we have a robot, it could be the, the kinematic dimensions of the robot, or, or if it's a soft robot, it could be the constitutive parameters, you know, Young's modulus or Poisson ratio. So things that really define the, the mechanical model itself. And if this is what we optimize for, then we can formalize uh, computational design problems or, or inverse design. I'll just give you an example of a project that we did a few years ago. Um, we started with this robot that that mm, I don't remember who designed it. Maybe maybe it was me. I don't remember. And we then loaded it up with as much weight as it could still carry. So basically, any more weight than this, it would saturate the motors. It would not be able to walk forward again. So then, in this inverse uh, design problem, what we ask for is how should the, the dimensions of the limbs change such that this planned forward walking motion will be using less torques, right? So we are minimizing torque input, but trying to keep the same reference motion. And here, what we see is a visualization of the changes in the, in the kinematic design and how that affects the torques required for locomotion. So the changes can be subtle, but the effect on the torque requirements can be quite, uh, quite significant. And so we, we did experiments to then validate this and make sure that the torques were indeed reduced as a function purely of the optimized mechanical design. 
And so basically this is uh, related to the topic of the ERC grant that I have, um, where I think we have an opportunity to be thinking about uh, a co-design process for the brain, by which I mean control policies and, and feedback loops and so on, as well as many different types of aspects of the mechanical design of the robots. Everything that has to do with uh, actuator placement or mechanical design of the support structures or of the feet or, or joints. So if this is something that sounds interesting to you, do reach out to us because we, I think there's a lot that we can do in this, in this space. All right. Um, so these are examples of projects where we had a simple motion goal in mind, uh, but we can also use data uh, to define the optimization criterions. So we can have motion capture data, for example, and run the same type of problem. And now we can have motion tracking controllers or imitation controllers, um, so on and so forth. I'll, I'll just highlight very quickly this uh, this result uh, from one of my students, where what we see on the on the left here is just motion capture data of a dog, and we're trying to come up with a controller that is able to reproduce as much of the footfall pattern and once his body motions and so on as as possible. It's it's a bit loud. Um, but it's another example of the type of work that we're doing in the lab. Um, if we have, uh, if we're optimizing over policy parameters, then this can go in the direction of learning by demonstration. Uh, and the goal here is to really go for generalization. And so here's the first prototype that uh, my PhD student Miguel was working on. So what we have here is a VR environment where he is manipulating this piece of virtual cloth. And the nice thing here is that he can just show what it is that he wants from the from this from this virtual towel. So basically, how should it be laid on the table? And this is much more intuitive than trying to come up with a formulation uh, with a mathematical formulation that will tell us, you know, fold the towel in a specific way. You can just show it. That's kind of the nice thing about it. And if we formalize then um, this learning process over control over policy parameters, then we can have a robot that is able to reproduce the overall behavior. And here there are all sorts of details in terms of how the motion objective can be generated. We can basically create a scaled down version of the demonstration, just what happened to the piece of cloth, scale it also in time. And that gives us a target for any arbitrary size of a towel. And so now we can just still say, I want the end result of this dynamic simulation of the towel to be as close as possible to what the demonstration was. All right, um, last but not least, if we have real world data and we're optimizing over model parameters, then we can solve what we call real to sim problems. So this is basically creating simulation models that look as much as possible as the uh, as, as real world physical objects. So this is an example. We start with a very complicated object. So it's the this this hand here. The fingers are made using a, a lattice structure. This whole thing is three D printed with silicone. So it's it's very difficult to to actually um, come up with a simulation model for this unless we want to really go to to very uh, dense discretization of the object. So what we did instead is we said, okay, we're going to have a, a rough approximation of this object. We're going to initialize it to some um, more or less random material parameters. We're going to try to move both the simulation object and the physical object in exactly the same way. And we will optimize for the constitutive parameters of the simulation object that will lead to the same characteristic behavior that we see in the physical specimen. And so with that, basically, even though our simulation model is very coarse, it captures you know, the, the range of deformations and frequency of motion that we see in the physical prototype. And here's an example that, that shows the benefits of this. You can basically come up with a physical prototype, do a bit of this validation work, uh, capture the motion, train a simulation model that is as close as possible to what you saw, and then in simulation, you can use this model to design a gate or do trajectory optimization 
um, whatever is important for, for your use case. And after that, uh, because you start with a simulation model that matched the physical prototype, then chances that the sim to real transfer is successful are much higher. So this is now basically the same gate that we designed in simulation with the learned simulation model. And here's the comparison between sim and real. So it's, it's quite a good match. All right, I'm close to the end of the talk. Um, you know, some, some questions that I like to think about, uh, you know, simulation models do have a lot of promise and they can help us solve some really hard problem, some really hard problems. You know, how far can we really uh, take them? How much can we rely on simulation models? It's a bit of an open question. Where do the models come from anyway? This is also a question that I think is very important. Um, the real to sim work is answering at least part of this question, but um, it's probably not the final answer. Uh, I just wanted to show one more project um, where basically we start to ask this question, you know, where do the um, simulation models come from? And basically in, in the work that I was showing, what we have is a simulation model. And the simulation model needs to give us a prediction. So basically, what is the state of the system at the next time step, as well as derivatives that will tell us how the state changes with respect to the previous state or the control parameters that we have available. Um, and so what we said is, well, you know, instead of trying to come up with uh, a simulation model for this, you know, can we just use a function approximator, and a neural network that learns just this kind of step-to-step -step dynamics model? Right, so how does the system evolve over in time? And if we have this and we take the Jacobians of the neural network, so how does the output change with respect to the input, then it's basically the same components that we needed from the simulation environment as we were trying to solve the inverse problems. So here is a, a brief uh, preview of some of the results that we can get with this approach. We learn a dynamic model uh, of a radio controlled car. This. So we have what we have here is a, an RC car. It's quite dynamic, so it drifts a lot. We assume that we don't know any kind of model for this type of you know, drifting uh, car. Of course, there are models, but for now, we assume we don't have it. So what we did first is we just collected data where we randomly drove the car by playing with the joysticks. And we recorded all of this information. We trained it in a supervised manner into the neural network that learns the dynamics. And then we basically replaced our differentiable simulator with this neural network, and we can solve trajectory optimization problems in the same way, but using this model that's entirely learned. So these are some of the results that we get. It's not perfect, but considering the fact that we're not even telling it as a prior what happens when you're pushing the forward you know, uh, joystick bu button, it's actually able to infer quite a surprising amount of information um, and so again, when, when, when we were collecting this data, we were not trying to solve any particular type of problem. It was really just exercising the dynamics of the system. And after that, uh, we were able to leverage this learned model for motion planning problems. All right, so with that, um, I will end my talk. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Happy to take some questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Stelian, for the great talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. You can either uh, put uh, raise your hand and, and unmute yourself or write in the chat and I will read the question for you. So who wants to start? Let's see. Yeah, I think that's a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk and uh, lots of cool work. One natural question is uh, um, I think most of the work presented was somewhat uh, open loop control. So uh, one, nat one natural question is uh, robustness to uncertainty and noise. And are you using uh, these methods in a feedback manner? Or, so, uh... right. Uh, for for some of our projects, we do use it in in an MPC like manner. So for the RC car, we did some of that. Right. We 
we plan a trajectory, we execute a small piece of it, and we then re-optimize uh, from wherever it is that the dynamical system got. Um, in principle, that, that could work quite well. Uh, there are computational challenges, so sometimes solving these problems is quite expensive. You cannot do it in, in real time. Um, this is where maybe some of the, um, the work that we're doing in learning control policies. So you're, you're doing a lot of work offline, but then at the end, uh, it's, it's mostly just an inference problems to, to come up to, with a solution to a new situation. Um, so that could be you know, part of the, the, the answer in tackling this challenge. But you're right. A lot of the things that we've shown here are open loop trajectories. Um, and the feedback component is something that we still have to work on. So if I can follow up quickly, for example, the example of placing the towel, um, would it work if the towel moved a bit or something uh, while you're placing it? You know, that's a very mm -hmm. good question. And um, so what we need to know initially is the state of the towel. And for now, we're kind of taking shortcuts. We assume that it's, this towel is always draping due to gravity, so we kind of know it. Otherwise, you could try to scan it. Um, you know, maybe an interesting question is for such a dynamic motion that is also very kind of short horizon, I don't know exactly how much um, room there is for feedback in, in this setting, right? I mean, if you think of the way you do it, uh, in which you might, you know, put a, a sheet on a on a table. Well, sometimes it just doesn't fall in the right way, and you do it again, uh, rather rather than sort of co correcting that behavior in the midst of doing it. Um, well, yeah, I guess you could uh, try to catch it, and do some stuff, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> to put this all together in a in a prototype system, of course, you need a very good and fast perception system as well. And so basically many different challenges that, that have to be addressed all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Great. Then there is a Mario Sinani from the chat asking that that's not really a technical question, but it's more asking to provide some material. Uh, on uh, trajectory optimization for locomotion problems and co-design. Uh, probably you, you said you have uh, the links on your website. Yes, for the papers, yes. Um, yeah, in the course that I'm teaching, uh, I was not planning on advertising the course, but... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, do, we do sort of uh, go through this type of uh, methodology in a slower and more methodical manner. So if this is something that's of interest to you, maybe maybe a, you know taking a course like that would be good. Um, also hands-on examples that you can program and start simple. What's the name of the class? Um, you know, so actually it used to be called computational models of motion in the computer science department. Uh, this coming spring, it's going to be part of the digital humans uh, course. So okay. some of the motion planning, um, trajectory optimization, and so on would be discussed in there. But it would be a bit less kind of applicable to robotics, but the, the fundamental methodology is quite similar. OK, good. Then there is another question from Ojas, uh, who says, uh, is this dynamic training like you showed in the RC car? Uh, do you think that this, this kind of training could be made, for, could be useful also for surgical robots? Ooh. I think. Uh... Hmm. Um, so let me tell you why we chose an RC car first. Uh, it's it's um, you know for the first prototype of this idea, it's a relatively low dimensional dynamical system. It does exhibit very interesting dynamics. But it's also very safe in the sense that anything you try will lead to, to some kind of behavior, so evolution in the state, but this thing doesn't you know, fall over, it doesn't crash and burn. So uh, before we go to surgical robots, you know, if you have a legged robot, 
and the action space is at the joint level, you know, either joint torques or, or set points, I doubt that this thing is going to work. It's too high dimensional and so many actions completely fail, right? You don't have a chance to discover a locomotion gate as you're just randomly applying joint commands. Um, so this is, you know, maybe one of the big challenges. And in the same way for a surgical robot, I guess I would need to understand a bit more about the, the overall problem setting. But the question is how safe is it to explore the action space? If it is safe, so you know anything you try, it leads to a valid observation that might be meaningful in motion planning. Probably something like this could could work. I would try it. Um, right, makes sense. Yeah, and and if the, if in the action space, you know, you have you have a, a, a much lower dimensional latent space of actions that make sense for surgical robots then at the very least, you'd have to focus this exploration process in that latent space, if you if you know it. All right. Yes, uh, or just if, if this answered your question or not, like follow up. Um, I also have a question, which is, which is uh, so I'm very interested in this uh, computational design uh, and fabrication projects you have. Uh, and a question I have related to this is is the following. So you, um, how, or let's say, did you start uh, studying concatenations of these simulations? For instance, now you were you were showing the design, you were optimizing at the same time the the design of the mechanics of the robot and the placement of actuators, for instance, or or, mm. but one could think also to to place sensors based on the perception pipeline or based on any other algorithm. And now you have different dynamics that play a, role, a certain role in the system design. Uh, and the, let's, let's pretend you can, all, you can formulate all of those using differentiable simulation. Can, can you do things uh, in a compositional manner where, where things compose? Um, because that would be interesting to me. Uh, to see how well it scales, for instance. Uh... Yes, uh, I think it's. Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question properly. So I guess it depends. Like, on let me give you a, a practical example. Like, you want to design the the chassis of the robot or or the car, for instance. The choose the controller, choose the motion planner, given a task, let's say. Also choose where to put the sensor and which perception pipeline you to use, for instance, parameterized through some some uh, control actions you have. So in in principle, as a concept, uh, I think this could work, right? If you have a way of generating an optimal motion, or actually, um, yeah, maybe even one step back. So the, the, the very basic ingredient that you need is a forward simulation model, right? Okay. So the forward simulation model would have to include some model of the sensor, some model of the controller that will tell you how to map this observation into a control sequence or into a control action. And then the actual simulation of the entire dynamical system forward in time. And if yes. you have this and all these modules are differentiable, it just becomes a set of chain rules. So yes. conceptually, it's possible. Okay. Okay, okay. What, what I'm interested in, for instance, in my research is to see how much we can decouple the simulation. Uh, I mean, of course, this would be a huge simulation, right? Uh, with the, all the parameters of the sensors, the controllers, and so on, how much can you can you simplify by decomposing? Yeah, I mean, at some at some level, if you decompose things, it might be equivalent to doing something like uh, cyclic coordinate descent, which is a technique mm -hmm. for optimization, right? You fix some variables, and you assume there's no coupling to other variables, and you optimize only for those. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. So yeah. sort of the, I think that's that's perhaps the best thing you can hope for is that it's going to have that type of behavior. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, 
that's a good food for thought. Um, let's see, we have another question. Oh, yes, uh, from Prakrut Kotecha. <clears throat> Thank you for the amazing talk. My question is, just like you use neural networks for learning dynamics of RC car, can we do the similar thing for a chaotic system? <laughs> um, yeah, so a, a chaotic system. I <laughs> Okay, so we can think of a double invariant pendulum, right? Is that is that the simplest uh, example? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, yes i i think something like this could work so you could learn the dynamics i mean of course you know the question is how sensitive is this model what happens to um modeling error do they do they grow or do they decay whatever uh so these these are going to be the same types of questions you have to deal with with analytic models as well but in principle something like this you could work what what is very important is to make sure that you're exploring the state space properly, right? So it would help a lot if you had, you know, some robotic system that could just say, put your double invariant pendulum in this particular configuration and then let it go from there. Otherwise, you might be kind of biased and you only learn uh, a small subset of the dynamics. But if you have a way of, of really mapping the entire space, then this approach could work. Right, seems. Uh, let, let's follow up if uh, Prakrut has other questions. Uh, I see Carlo. Do you have a question? Yes, I have. Good. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have one question about the contact and friction model. Um, I wanted to ask whether it it applies also to contact with soft objects and um, if it can handle as well phenomena like uh, rotational slippage rather than, you know, linear slippage. Um, so what, what do you mean by rotational slippage? Uh, Is it like a ball? Uh, I know. I'm, I'm saying a case like um, you have a pen like this and, uh, you know, it falls down, therefore, like it undergoes some kind of rotation. Um, my question comes from the fact that you're using um, Coulomb friction, uh, mm -hmm. and then it's like it only has like uh, linear components, let's say, an X and Y components or tangential and normal. Yeah, components. yeah. I mean, in in principle, if your rigid object has enough points that all have to satisfy Coulomb friction, then you can also capture rotational effects. Okay, okay. So you're applying Coulomb friction at uh, distributed points, let's yes. say, yes. all, at all these elements. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay, and uh, therefore, like you also have done uh, this, your simulation, like with this contact model, also includes soft objects as well. So we we so far have only done rigid or soft objects with static objects mm -hmm. that are rigid. So we did not do uh, deformable to deformable. Mm -hmm. That conceptually should work, but from an implementation point of view, it's very it's very challenging. Right, you have to discretize the deformable objects, and the way in which you're modeling the the contact patches between them that matters a lot. Right, you have to start doing things like triangle to triangle intersection or things like that. Make sure that as you go across edges, things are still continuous and well defined. Uh, it's a challenge for for that regime. But other than that, the the formulation stands. Okay. Right, so it's really the this this function g of x, which tells you the the penetration that gets really complicated uh, if you have complex geometry in the scene, including the formable objects. That's clear. Thank you. Great. Any final question? Doesn't seem so. Right, Stelian, it's getting dark here in Zurich. Okay. Thank you again very much for, for uh, your talk. It was a lot of interesting material. Um, and I uh, wish you good luck for the next steps in the projects. Yeah, thank you. And thanks again for inviting me and for your attention. You're welcome. And see thank you all you. next week for the next autonomy talk. Bye. Bye-bye.